the big one. Okay. okay. There's Shelby and Jennifer. Hello there. Hi, Jen. Hey, Jennifer. How are you? Great. Hello, everybody. Hey, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we have the most important people here. Let's see if anyone. <laughs> we have um, 18 signed up. So, which is okay. a good thing. So, yes. So, that's good. Great. Glad to see that. Um, I don't know. I didn't just check it just now, but yes. So we are recording. That should come up, pop up when you sign in. I think it says, you know, you are recording, you know, either stay with the meeting or, or leave it. So, um, and that way we can send it out like we did this week for the for last week's. So what happens if I click on continue? You're good. You're good. Uh, is, is, is my computer going to explode? <laughs> no, it is not. Okay. Well, all right. I did. There it goes. Okay. <laughs> So we got a couple minutes here. We have some other people joining who are on the panel. Good. Very good. So okay. we should be able people you the people that want to share a screen will be able to now. So all right. Okay. So we've got that as well. Mark, is that a picture of your garden? Um this picture like of Ash from before the springtime. In Jen knows. Yeah, that's oh. the that's the that's the spring uh, our garden show at the at Adams Ferricker Farms. Nice. Um, and we put that as a background because uh, so you don't have to look at my house. <laughs> You're looking <laughs> at my cube. Boy, you're pretty busy, aren't you? Look at all that stuff. <laughs> I know there's a lot of stuff over there. And I know you're not sitting in a barn, Jennifer. No, I'm sitting downstairs, just... but I've got the dogs here, and nobody wants to see the dogs running around bad down here. So, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I want to see the dogs. Are I know you want to see the dogs. They, <laughs> well, I will be muted, so it won't be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> so they're pretty good. They're actually laying down right now. One's on the couch, one's on the floor, and one's under my feet. So, okay, they're being good so far. I know, but well, I've heard your dogs before. I know that's when we I've were heard outside. Them on, I yeah, I've heard them on Zoom calls, Jennifer. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> the perils from working from home. Yeah. So. so here's Amanda. Yes. So one of the Amandas. Yes, 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 yes. I got to see Mark, Mark and Amanda last last week, was it? Yeah. At the Farm Bureau. Right. Or two weeks ago, I guess it was. Yeah. But Farm Bureau policy picnic. Yeah, that was nice. Yes, it was nice. Except that it wasn't handicap accessible. Not it by really, a long shot. Not by a long <laughs> shot, no. Even with well, my we, knees, getting yeah. up on that one step was was kind of a stretch, but <laughs> that's all right. Hey, Amanda. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. You can unmute yourself. There we go. There you go. Hello, Hello Hi, there. Man. We got Brian. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Usually when I say hi, the dog, that's when the dogs bark, but they didn't. They all seem to get this computer stuff. <laughs> hey, everybody. How you doing? Good, and you? Very well, thank you. Good. We had, how many did we have Shelby for last week's? 20? I think the highest oh, we, we, that we I saw 30, was 21. 20, yeah, 21. 22. But, we, but 30 or 31 had signed up for it. So they'll yes. get the when I sent When I sent the email today, I used the email list from the first session and the second session. And I sent great. it to I, almost 80 people. Yeah, I saw that. That was great. It was very good. They'll be, they're on. They're just not telling you. <laughs> yeah. I'm the host, the hostess with the mostest, and I should know that who's who's coming on, and I don't see them, but we'll get there. It's just it's just now seven o'clock, so hopefully we'll get 
some more people signed up, signed up. Some people just want to have it. They want to just have access to it. So they email so they can get it later on. I know a couple of people that asked me that specifically for the last, last weeks. So they, they signed, they, you know, they, they signed up, but they didn't show up that night because they were busy. So this way they knew that they would get a copy of the recording. So people okay. tend to do that. So who is the rest of your speakers? Let's see, we have Sam, we have Mark, we have Mark, we have Amanda. Where's the other Amanda? I don't know where they went. Hmm. They're supposed to come in. We'll wait about two or three more minutes, then we're gonna get going, get started. Yes. And, and Mark, I sent this out to the um, to the market managers from last year when we did when I met with the farm store owners. Um, so I sent it to that list as well. So that okay. about this recording for tonight. So we'll see. We'll see. Do, do, do. And the county did put out a Facebook blast as well. I did see that. Um, so they, they did do that as well for this for tonight. Okay. And we had a press release a few weeks ago. Yep, it was on the radio, so. That doesn't look like Shelby. No. <laughs> ah. Are you, is that Lauren? Yes, it's me. Okay, great. It works. Hi, 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 everyone. Okay, good. I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay, great. So. so no worries, folks. There are more people that signed up for it. They may not be coming tonight, but they certainly wanted the recording. So we're going to proceed just like we would even if there was 100 people on the call as well. Okay. All right. I'm Jen Fimble. I'm the Ag Navigator for Dutchess County. And I welcome you to our third in a series of five uh, Farming in Dutchess virtual programs. Um, this is the one on local foods and its importance. And if you'd like to access those, you will get a link to this recording in an email if you signed up, but it's also um, available on the Dutchess County Government under Planning and Development's website. So, Tonight's moderator and organizer of this evening is Mark Adams from Mark Adams Greenhouses. Mark, take it away. Okay, uh, thanks. Listen, um, what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about who's gonna be speaking and what we're gonna be talking about. So this series, I don't know if Jen said this, but it's, it's presented by the Dutchess County Agricultural Advisory Committee and Shelby and Jennifer have been working really hard to get this going. So what we're trying to do is talk about local foods and their importance, like Jen said. And we've got a panel with Dr. Simon, who just wants to be called Sam. I know that, he never wants to be called Dr. Simon. And we can't hear you, Sam. You can unmute yourself and disagree with me if you want. <laughs> and we also have Amanda Dykeman from uh, She's for, are you the owner of Dykeman Farms? I didn't know. Okay. And you're also muted. But, um, and then right now we have Lauren Kaplan, who's the CSA director at Poughkeepsie Farm Project. And we're hoping, oh, Mark Doyle is the manager at Fishkill Farms. And each panelist is going to tell a little bit about their operation and talk about the challenges and the successes and the future of, uh, of local foods. And I have a different panelist for each of the different ideas. You know, one is talking about CSAs, which is community supported agriculture. One is talking about farm markets and the other about farmers markets. And uh, Mark will be talking about pick your own operations. So, but um, 
I also wanted to say there are around 600 farms in Dutchess County right now. And I think I figured out, you can correct me if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, uh, Lauren, but I th think there are about eight or nine, no, there, I'm not sure how many CSAs there are, but you, you know you, you've got the CSAs under, under control. And I know there are probably about eight or nine farmers markets as opposed to farm markets. Farmers markets are the markets where everybody uh, gathers together and sells, you know, in one location. And a farm market is where there's one farm market where people go to. So I'd like to start off by having Sam, Dr. Sam Simon, uh, give us a little bit of background as to what he considers to be local and why it would be important for people to buy local products. So, Sam. I'm unmuted, correct? Can you hear me? Unfortunately, we can still hear you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, inviting me to this discussion. <clears throat> How do I define local? I define local, I guess, within uh, 60 miles of the plant. The mission of Hudson Valley Fresh was, how do we preserve what's left of the dairy farms in Dutchess, Columbia, and Ulster County? And the mission was, how do we create a economic sustainable enterprise, which started 15 years ago? And the only way and I thought we could do that is that we delivered a premium product and then charged what it cost to process and deliver that product. And the cost basis is what do the farmers at the farm need for their milk, for the raw milk at the farm? And it's pretty apparent that today, the price of our Hudson Valley Fresh product, the raw milk costs 23 cents a pound. That's what the farmers are receiving for that product that is bottled under Hudson Valley Fresh label. When you realize the commodity price that the farmers are receiving is $17 a hundredweight or 17 cents a pound, as a big difference. So it is pretty clear that you cannot compete on the generic market if you're gonna charge what the farmers need to survive. And to do that, to, to justify it, you need to deliver a premium product that tastes and works differently. And that's what it was all about. And when I moved to Dutchess County in the early seventies, there were 370 dairy farms. And today I believe there are about 11 or 12 you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what happened, right? The question actually, always we have comes close up, to 20, 20, 20, Sam, just so you know. <laughs> we actually do have about 20 dairy farms left. About 20 dairy farms. In farms. Dutchess County? Yes, we do. 20? Yep. Thanks well, to you, the, Sam. Thanks farming. to you. <laughs> Thanks to you. Yeah, right. But, the, <laughs> what, but the, the reality is there were 370, right? That's the sad part. But what is the challenge? And the challenge is trucking of the raw milk, right? Is one. Number two is how do you get customers? And the way we did it was we did tasting stores. And the first store that allowed us to do tastings of Hudson Valley Fresh product was Adams. And it's word of mouth. It's labor intensive. It started there. And then it went to, from stores to schools, to public schools, colleges. And sure enough, unbeknownst to me, coffee shops. And that was our biggest market. And that was the market in New York City. The labor challenge is the drivers for trucks to deliver the product. And you know, the drivers are the ambassadors because they see the customer much more often than you do. The question is how did COVID affect us? It was dramatic. March 16th, New York City shut down. New York City was at least 35% of our finished product. Three trail loads of product were going to New York every week. And March 16th, that went to zero. What came on board were other stores, grocery stores in the Westchester area and some in Dutchess County that we, we were not providing to, but they could not get dairy in a consistent way because of the problems of drivers, truckers, and loading at the, at the docks. We own our own trucks we could provide that service. That made a big difference. 
and that took that recaptured about 20% of the market that we had lost. It's too soon to tell what the long-term effects of COVID will be. Remember, this is their first rodeo with COVID. They've never, the doctors don't know, it's ever changing and it's mutating. And so it's to be seen. We're hoping the schools are planning to open up in two, three weeks. And that's a big part of our market locally. We provide dairy to all the colleges, including the CIA and West Point. That's a big market. And we do that exclusively. It's almost like totally exclusively. Um, our, the biggest thing for the future for Hudson Valley Fresh is to be as efficient as we can at the plant. We bought the plant, the Boyce Brothers plant in 2019. So the farmers now own the cows, <clears throat> the processing plant, the marketing and the delivery. So we're in total control. We're vertically integrated. And the reason for buying the plant is that somebody else doesn't come in there, buy it, tear it down. <clears throat> we never were co-packaged, which means whatever's in our package says Hudson Valley Fresh, that's Hudson Valley Fresh coming from nine family farms. Nine farms, about 3,000 cows and 9,000 acres of open space. And those farmers are great stewards of the land. They, pro they um, have great practices on soil conservation. And um, it's, the reality is if there wasn't Hudson Valley Fresh, five or six of these family farms milking 150 cows or less would be out of business. Because for the last 10 years, we provided a monthly dividend based on the volume of sales of Hudson Valley Fresh to every farm. And every farm's an equal partner in this project. Didn't matter if you milk 50 cows or 300 cows, your investment in the project was equal. Your dividend is equal. The other <clears throat> question to answer is, is it a career? I'd say yes, because the young lady who was a Cornell graduate two years ago, Courtney Roberts, I see her as the future leader of this whole project. And um, she's superb in marketing, has technical, <coughs> excuse me, the skills on the computer and what do you call, uh, <laughs> Facebook, et cetera. So she knows how to communicate in the 21st century. <coughs> I'm still on the rotary phone. So, you know, there's a place. The biggest challenge is we're moving a perishable item. I think that's the biggest challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is in a nutshell, what we're all about. I don't want to. I don't want to force you to uh, to uh, use use up too much of your voice, Sam. But I did want to. I know you can tell me. There's more to it than just local. You need to have a better product, and that's what Hudson that's Valley right, quality product. That's what <laughs> Hudson Valley Fresh provided. Um, right. You know, in other words, in other words, not saying oh buy it because it's local, but buy it because it's better. No. We, it, the standard that I set 15 years ago was based on, <clears throat> you can measure the quality of the milk at the farm. Every farm cow on a farm is tested twice a month for the health of the cow, the butter fat and the protein and the volume of milk she produces. That's like going to the doctor twice a month. But we have that on a computer, I get that readout every week because every week every day that a milk is tested we take the sample of the product of the herd but every month there's a a printout of each cow twice a month so we know and we know the number that they have to reach which means a somatic cell count of under 200,000 and all farms are below that and which means the healthy cows the average somatic cell in the industry is closer to three to 400. Acceptable in the industry is 700. There See, is no the farm in Hudson Valley Fresh that's at 300 ever. <coughs> See, that's so, that's the point that I wanted to make. That's the point. So, and uh, you can only do that if you're controlled, you have a control of where the milk is coming from. 
We do not blend with any other herds other than those nine farms. We started with two and grown to nine. To be part of the mission, <clears throat> each farm had to demonstrate one year of somatic cell under 150 every day. Nice. That's quite a one year, not one month, not that's six a months, challenge. Right. So that's great, Sam. Now, what I want to do is is bring in um, a couple of the other people to talk about some other aspects of of uh, local, and I want to see. Well, that's Lauren over there. Now, Lauren Kaplan, aka Shelby Frank, on the screen. <laughs> You're you are the uh, CSA director at Poughkeepsie Farm Project. Now, CSA, which is um, Community Supported Agriculture, is a big part of the local scene. Um, could you explain a little bit about what you're doing and what some of the challenges are with, uh, with the Community Supported Agriculture? Yes, I would love to. Uh, thanks again for having me here, Mark and everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Lauren Kaplan. I'm the CSA and Farm Communications Director at Poughkeepsie Farm Project. Um, in addition to working at PFP, I have also worked um, at a few other farms, including a 700-member CSA farm in California. Um, so I've been doing CSA for a few years. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Poughkeepsie Farm Project, we were founded uh, as a nonprofit farm in 1999. So we've been running for a little over 20 years. Um, when we started, our organization was growing on about three acres of farmland. And we had about a 70 member CSA. Um, since then, we are now growing on about 15 acres and our CSA is about 500 to 550 members during peak season. Um, we've also since acquired a few fancy high tunnels so we can grow greens year round. So in addition to offering our main season CSA, we also offer a winter share of about around 100 members over the winter. Um, so um, one of the things that I think really makes CSAs appealing for, for consumers, um, in addition to being able to get um, products like Samson that is a higher quality product, it's fresher, it's more nutritious, it's more delicious, um, particularly with vegetables, right? You're, if, you're, if you're buying from, directly from a farm, whether it's a farmer's market or a farm stand or a CSA, um, you're getting produce that is grown for flavor, um, not to sit on a grocery store shelf for however long it needs to in transit and then in the grocery store and then on the consumer's counter before they're actually ready to eat it. Um, you're able to grow varieties for taste and flavor and to pick them closer to peak ripeness. So um, we offer a really good product. Um, it's at a very good price point when you think about what um, you would be paying for organic quality product at the grocery store. Um, and on top of the product itself, we're also offering um, a relationship. So a unique opportunity for consumers to support farms um, and to give them the financial support up front when the farmers need it to purchase seeds and pay for labor um, and do everything that goes into actually growing and producing the vegetables that we eventually distribute. Um, one of the other benefits of joining a CSA is that you're reducing, you're reducing food waste in the sense that um, as a CSA farm, we have a pretty good sense of how many CSA members we have and how much we need to grow to meet those numbers. Um, if we were doing something like a farmer's market, we might spend a lot of time harvesting vegetables, choosing the most beautiful ones, cleaning them up, packing them up, setting them up, and then it could rain or it could be a hundred degrees and people wanna be at the beach. Um, and we can't reuse that, those vegetables once they've sat out. So 
there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, markets, markets can be lucrative. They can also be kind of risky. I'm sure that uh, other folks on this call will speak more to that, but um, CSA is a really great opportunity for consumers to create a relationship with a farm and a very substantive supportive relationship. Um, uh, one of the challenges that I think we've been seeing, and this is probably not a surprise to anyone on this call, um, is the issue of labor. Um, we happen to be lucky at Poughkeepsie Farm Project that we um, we pay decently compared to what, I guess what I've experienced at some other farms. Um, and we happen to have a really great working culture and work environment. So we do tend to have a number of people on the farm team specifically that will stay from year to year. Um, it's a place that they like to be, they like to work. Um, uh oh. <laughs> Is Lauren just thinking or is she? Uh... Hey, Jen, you're muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, she, her screen is frozen. Um, so she can't, it's, 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 she has a bad internet connection. So I don't know if you can hear us, Lauren. Try calling back we'll in. Get, yeah, we'll get back to Lauren in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm hoping that she can get back in. That would be great. She's completely gone now. Well, there she is over there. That's a different Shelby. Which Shelby Frank is she? So that's so, Shelby um, from Amanda. the office. Oh, that's Shelby from the office. Yeah. So, I, hey, Amanda, um, unmute yourself. Okay, I wanted to ask Amanda about, I know she has a farm market and a farmer's market. And um, since we don't have, since we don't have Amanda Scusa on the call, I don't think she was going to be talking about farm markets. Amanda, you can tell us a little bit about what you, what you think the role is for a farmer's market and a farm market, since you have both fortunately. Yes. Um, in 2008, Henry and I um, were invited as Dykeman Farm to participate in the Pauling Farmers Market in its opening year. It started out with four vendors right in the village. We were quite skeptical since we, our farm um, being a fourth generation farm did start out selling produce in the village of Pauling door to door. But we found that as the season went on, the customer base was some locals, but it also um, had a um, large quantity of people that were just traveling through the area, saw the sign, um, liked to visit Pauling to go to any of the other shops in the area. Um, so we were quite surprised. Um, we started off on a little dead end road in the village and it grew to be a, where we needed to go to the village and ask for a bigger space. Um, I have a unique position where, um, as Henry and I did take over uh, the daily operations of Dykeman Farm this year, we, um, we also have been in the farmer's market since 2008, and um, I'm on the board of directors for about the last 10 years. Um, so seeing it from the aspect of having to help develop the market and then also to be a vendor has been really interesting to hear the customers, to hear the other vendors and to really do my part to help make it grow and support not only the farmer's market, but the vendors and the supporting um, um, businesses in Pauling. The market was basically started to be, to be a, a source of local fresh food. Um, we've had live music from day one until COVID. Um, it's been such a great atmosphere um, trying to provide such a large variety of, of uh, different items to people. Um, it, it also is a house for charitable organizations to set up. 
and just let everyone know, um, you know, what their organization is about and educate them and, you know, hopefully um, help get donations if they need it. Um, we reach customers through Facebook, Instagram, email blasts. Prior to COVID, we also were having a um, farm to table dinner every other year. That was a huge success. It helped raise the funds um, to keep the market going. Our market is one of the lowest um, vendor fee markets in the county. Um, so what we're trying to do is if we can keep the vendors costs down, then the vendors can then pass on that savings to their customers. So um, the goal is fresh local food um, at a reasonable price. Um, we, we really um, encourage the vendors to set pricing that, you know, just, just be fair. Um, obviously we can't tell them how to price, but um, again, we, if, if they have issues even with um, getting staffing, we, we try to help them with that. As we know, um, sometimes having somebody commit to a season can be difficult. So if we can help cut their costs and even help volunteer in their booth, uh, we will try to do that. We are an all volunteer board. Um, there's about 18 of us right now um, setting up everything every week, greeting people, making sure everyone is aware of what vendors are there, what products are there, and just listening to the customers and say what, you know, what we could add. Uh, has been very important and helped make our market grow. COVID has affected us. It made us busier than ever. Um, so as we had to follow all the guidelines, we, you know, we roped off different areas. We put more of our volunteers on hand. Um, being a vendor at the market, it was extremely busy. Everybody was, has been looking for fresh local food. Prior to COVID, we found that it helped tell people about our farm, which I think the other vendors are seeing too. They're getting, they might be able to get more foot traffic um, because maybe somebody didn't know that they were in an area. Um, but overall, um, the farmer's markets are a great way for um, the farms to be able to get out there and put their name out there, provide fresh vegetables and um, bread and meats and cheeses to maybe people that wouldn't have stopped at a farm stand along the way or um, signed up for a CSA if maybe they couldn't commit to something on a weekly basis. Um, we were seeing more and more people that are just saying, we saw the sign as we were out for a drive. Um, so it, it's really just been phenomenal just to say, I saw the sign. So we just stopped into Pauling. And um, we, we really just overall are planning to do our best to listen to the customers, hear what they have to say and try to continue to change with whatever they need. Um, the surrounding communities, you know, everyone there has been pretty good to, to just show up, support the vendors and keep coming back week after week. Hey, that's great. Hey, Amanda, since you, uh, Lauren's back. Yeah. Um, now let me let, so Amanda, I, I'm going to ask you a couple questions about the farmer's market. Then we'll let Lauren finish and then we'll come back to farm markets. But I, I had, since you brought up the idea of price, um, I was wondering, you said you charge the vendors, uh, what, what a little bit of money, what, where does that, what is that money for that the vendors pay? What is that? Ten, what does that cover? That helps cover. Um, we um, we have some um, fees that we're currently to pay for, like music, or um, we had to buy some of the supplies to meet the regulations to uh, open for COVID. Um, typically, it just goes back into advertising. We usually um, get a. a, a full size billboard on route 22. Um, just all the basic, we do a lot of print ads if, okay. if possible. Okay, because you're a volunteer board, but hey, how? what do you pay the, the uh, musicians? <laughs> I might want a gig there. It's good, it's great. <laughs> okay, but no, so there are some costs involved, even though it's a volunteer board. Yes. Um, because, uh, you know, I was always concerned about pricing with local foods, mm -hmm. and that's a big issue because you don't want to get into the situation where everybody thinks that local means expensive. Yeah. So um, 
you know, trying to keep the cost down, I think is important, uh, of an important aspect. Uh, not that you should keep it below the cost of production, but just to make sure that you are figuring out a way that people can afford to buy the stuff. So um, then we'll get back to the uh, farm market, but let Lauren finish. She got cut off in the middle and now, now you're back on a different computer. Is that the idea? Because now well, it says Lauren. <laughs> I'm on the same phone, but it looks like it gave me the opportunity to show up as myself. So thank you, oh, Sheldon, okay. for letting me be you <laughs> for the first few minutes of this call. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure where I got cut off. Um, so I think I was just saying that labor is one of the challenges that we face. Um, right. And, and I think also in light of what um, you and Amanda were just speaking about, um, you know, the, the price is certainly a factor. And I think with CSA, folks see the initial price, the upfront price, and it feels really expensive. Um, so one of the challenges that we've been sort of working through in my time here is trying to, and I think a lot of CSA farms have been, this, this is a subject that has come up um, at some of the Hudson Valley CSA coalition meetings, is how to communicate what that price actually means um, on a weekly basis, what it would mean if you were buying the same produce at the grocery store, um, and also just communicating what, what a CSA is. Um, so even though it may look really expensive upfront, when you break it down and you take a look at the weekly cost, when you see everything that you're getting for that money, um, it may not be cheap. I don't like to say that it's cheap because it's not. Um, but it's a great value for what it is and compared to what you would get um, at other places, especially if you consider the pick your own component and the other things that we offer through our CSA specifically, it is a very good value for the product. Um, so I think trying to communicate that to folks who maybe haven't participated in a CSA before is an ongoing challenge and one that we get a lot of support with um, from the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition too. So I, th I think you told me that you have more, more uh, members than you can actually handle. Is that, is that true? You said it was, it's tough on pickup day, especially with COVID around. So last year uh, we saw a huge spike in CSA interest uh, right around the time that COVID hit. Um, so conveniently for, for CSA farms that were looking for signups, you know, before April, um, you know, that was a time when people weren't even sure if they were going to be able to find toilet paper on the shelves. Uh, so I think there was a big spike in interest in all things local, all things food. Um, and at this point, we've seen some of that lesson. So, so people now know that they're going to be able to get food, they can still go shopping at the grocery store. Um, so I think I think that there are some people who had signed up for shares last year, who maybe haven't signed up this year. Um, and I, I've been speaking with people about that, because it's, it's interesting. Um, we do still have a lot of members, um, but we are not as packed this season as we were last season. Um, and Again, I was speaking with a few people about this the other day. Some of my coworkers were asking about this. And I think there were some people who maybe left the CSA who are going to realize that the quality of food that they were getting at PFP, you know, or at other farms where they would make a commitment is really different than what they're getting maybe before they joined a CSA. So I think it'll be interesting to see over the next few years if people's buying decisions do change as a result of decisions they may have made during COVID and sort of explored a new way of sourcing their food more locally. Um, and they may circle back around to that after they start to notice the difference in quality. Um, that's my hope and my guess, but I, I guess we'll be okay. interested to see how it all shakes out. That's great. Okay, well, um, well thanks, Lauren. Uh, that's good for now. Um, I want to let Mark Doyle talk before we get back to the uh, farm market from Amanda, but Mark has graciously at the last minute joined us. 
Um, and uh, I want Mark to talk about you pick, even though you have a farm market and you have all kinds of things going on at Fishkill Farms. But I'd like to know about some of the you pick uh, ideas and how that, you know, how that gets into the local scene. Oh, good evening. Thank you, Mark. Um, Fishkill Farms actually started you pick um, as a as a last resort somewhere around 1965. There was a 1965. Uh, <laughs> Jeez, Mark. Well, the farm. The, the farm was purchased by the family in, in 1914, so they had some experience before that. But um, in 1965, there was apparently a bad uh, thunderstorm and a lot of hail, and the apple crop was severely damaged. And up to that time, they'd been doing, you know, principally uh, wholesale markets to, to supermarkets and so on. The crop was so badly damaged that it wasn't going to make the grade for for that type of sale. So as a last resort, they said, well, look, we'll open the farm to the public, to the local community and see how it goes because the apples were still fine. They were just dented by the hail. And um, it turned out they had the best year ever that year. So realizing um, the, the power of the, the local community and the desire to be you know, on a farm and experiencing uh, all it is to be experienced. Um, the, the, the farm launched into it and, and has never looked back. So, you know, um, today we find ourselves refining every, every aspect of it every year, um, learning, taking notes and relearning from our mistakes. But um, it is, it's a sort of a, a constant fascination of how to um, firstly attract the customers, and then secondly, how to actually, you know, give them the best experience possible and still be paid for it in the process. Um, so uh, uh, lots of challenges. Um, you know, we, we rely massively on social media um, and on the web. It is, it is absolutely the key um, to our ability to communicate um, with the public about the availability of our crop and the timing. So um, through our, we have now about a 25,000 name or person um, newsletter that goes out weekly. So it's extraordinarily powerful in terms of being able to say, well, hang on a moment. Um, you know, this is not perhaps the week, despite the fact we've started picking peaches, um, this is an off week because that variety um, that we had last week isn't around any longer, just wait another week and uh, there'll be more. That sort of fine tuning uh, of, the, of the marketplace is something that um, is very, very rare. I, I can't really think of, of another instance where um, a, a business might be able to um, communicate so, so accurately with their customers. Um, but, but it comes with, um, you know, going back to inviting customers to the farm, um, a lot of preparation for that event. You know, we have to uh, think through our systems very, very carefully and um, have moved to a fully sort of uh, electronic cloud sales. So um, uh, Revel and Square uh, online point of sale systems are the, the name of the game for us anyway, um, which comes with thankfully uh, the use of a lot of cell service, uh, which is critical. I don't know what we would do if we didn't have good cell service, uh, cellular service, um, to, to be able to work with our customers, basically no matter where we are, we can, we can set up a sales point out in the field or close to the barn, wherever we like. And that's, that is critical, most critical now because, and I'm, I'm jumping all over um, this in terms of our, our sort of range of questions, but most critical now because since uh, the advent of COVID, we have moved to a, to a reservation system so that um, it's an online reservation system uh, via our website. And um, this enables us to even better fine tune 
um, the availability of the product uh, as it relates to the number of customers um, due to visit the farm and sp spread the, that number out evenly through the day and across the week um, so that we can manage our, our labor. But um, naturally, um, with that comes actually, um, you know, saying hi to the customer when they arrive, receiving and checking the customer in. So that again is is information centric. Uh, we have to be able to have our web service and our iPads all up and running. So it might look a little uh, crazy to a, a customer who's never seen an operation like this to see so many so many computers out in the field and. <laughs> that sort of thing, um, but um, it's nevertheless the the the, the high point. Um, we a couple of other things. You know, obviously the appearance of the farm is critical to um, the the satisfaction of the customers and appreciation. Um, the the another is the the labor situation. We um, in order to manage people requires people. We have um, our head count uh, right now is about a hundred people, a little over a hundred people. And you know, many, many of over half of those are part-timers and uh, most of those part-timers are high school students, but uh, we're incredibly lucky. Um, I'm not sure how this happens, but our um, school district has uh, consistently provided for us the most, and, and community, I should say, the most fabulous high schoolers that um, start you know, with us at the age of 14, very often at their first job, and um, don't know much of anything about working and even less about farming and absolutely nothing about some of the strange fruit that they see on there that, that we're selling. So, um, but in a very, very short period of time are able to, um, to respond to customers, give them the information that they need and just uh, manage all of these people day, you know, sort of for long days. So we're, we're really thrilled to have that, that capacity. Um, of course, this is all backed up by our, um, not just our local uh, labor force, but also, but also um, by a group of Jamaican men uh, and some women, actually, some of the wives who come in on H2A visas. This, these are um, temporary work visas um, for about nine months, up to about nine months of the year and live on the farm. We provide housing and transportation and all sorts of um, uh, accessory benefits to enable them to live on the farm. Um, so the, the, the labor component is pretty complex to having a, a, a pick your own operation. Um, but I think that when you, when you look at the, um, what I was talking about, the ability to communicate so directly with the customer, um, and of course, you know, this is in light for us in conjunction with the fact that we also have a CSA and a farm store and farmer's market. So the sort of this integration of marketplaces and communication and information is, is so, so, so critical um, to being able to really um, launch ourselves into the hearts and minds of our customers and win their, win their loyalty. Of course, uh, we have to be very careful not to disappoint people either because of, once again, the strength of communication, uh, bad news has, a, has the ability to spread fast. So we work extremely diligently to avoid any bad news. Um, so, so this is, we think, the strength of our, you know, sort of our resilience, whether it be in the face of COVID or, you know, uh, climate change or economic change, that we have this, this base of customers. And I would, you know, recommend it to anybody in our, in the Hudson Valley, that, that this is, um, a, a facet of farming uh, that can really offer you um, a business opportunity with real durability and um, potential profitability. Farming Profitability in farming is uh, never guaranteed, as we all know. And Mark, um, I did have, since you, now you have the reservation system because of COVID. 
Um, Cause I remember a couple of times at your place when it, I mean, on a beautiful weekend, it would almost get out of hand with the people showing up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you might want to keep that reservation system going forward. Um, even, you know, in the years to come, if that might smooth out then you know, the number of people and make it a little more manageable. Do you think that might be something in the future? Yes, absolutely. We're holding on to it tightly. Um, we were amazed last year um, with the strawberry season in June. We were absolutely dreading the possibility or the, you know, our knowledge of past seasons where at about 1130, everybody decides that that's the exact time that they need to show up on a Saturday morning and the, the line of vehicles stretches down and out onto I-84. And, and of course, that's extremely unhappy and dangerous um, and, and unpleasant for the neighbors. So uh, in this way, we've been able to, to smooth that out and have just as many people come. But the, you know, the impact on enjoyment um, for the customers is so, so great. And of course, to our ability to, to manage our system and actually to, to decrease labor a little bit, because of course we don't have to have this people on hand to take these huge crunch crowds. But thank you for okay. the question. Okay. So. Now, um, okay, so what I wanna do is, uh, it, thank you, Mark. Um, I wanna let Amanda speak a little bit about an actual farm market, which you have, I know, and I, and I know you do also, Mark, but Amanda's, she's, uh, she's had her market for how long have you had a farm market for like four generations or something like that? Yes. <laughs> um, the first generation and the second generation started selling off the back of a truck and door to door in the village of Pauling. And it grew the name, the reputation, um, and then in the early 1960s, a farm stand was built on Route 22. And from there, it just grew. And, you know, 25, 30 employees inside and, and 20 people out in the field. And, and then, you know, just generational reputation. Um, we still have people that are, we have one gentleman the other day that told me he now has purchased produce from all five of the generations. My, the fifth generation being my seven-year-old son um, who helps out at the farmer's market or the farm stand. Um, so it's just really been a, um, a, a true generational experience, which is where, you know, taking on a farmer's market, we, we thought we're in Pauling, everybody knows us, but they don't. So it's been a, a really good ride. So that, So now a farm market, how do you price your products at the farm market? Mostly by the pound. Sometimes it's by the basket, whether it be a pint or a quart, um, sometimes like a four quart basket, um, just mostly do you, do you, doing exactly. Do you, what do you look at, do you look at other prices in other places um, before you set your prices or do you just go by what it costs you to produce them? Mostly what it costs to produce and also knowing what we can go back 20 years and our prices to know. Uh, we also know relatively within certain our customer base and, you know, we plan and plant accordingly and, and always have access, but it's all been part of the record keeping for so many generations. Oh, you mean if it doesn't sell, you lower the price, is that yeah, the deal? It, or if you have extra, we know to start running a sale, make sure when okay. you know, they're picking, All right. you know, extra quantity. Okay, fair enough. So let's see now, uh, what we want to do now, I know there's a couple of people that might want to ask a couple of questions uh, to the panel. Um, Brian, or I see Jen there, Murphy, uh, or, or you, Jennifer, Shelby, do you want to ask any questions of, of us? Uh, you can even ask me a question if you want to. <laughs> so Come on, Brian, COVID, you must have something. <laughs> okay, during COVID, ahead, yeah. did, you, did you find that um, you really, you know, I commend all of our farmers because I, I think that a lot of our farmers really stretched out of the box for themselves during COVID, especially. Um, I think some of you already do that anyway, and it's maybe not so much of a stretch, but did you find that um, online 
platforms were really helpful during COVID at all? I mean, did you already have to create new new versions of your online platforms? I know we did it through the Todd Hill program, you know, the Todd Hill store. So I, I'm just curious how how that affected you. Anyone? I can uh, answer that to, to some extent. In our uh, Fishkill Farms farm store, we um, initially said, well, this is it's going to be difficult. We need to do provide essentially a grocery um, from the farm store as it could by pick up and put out in an email the, the sort of the inventory that we had available and people had to call in to place orders. So that was, um, it actually worked really well because we had the flexibility on the call to respond to the fact that we may have low inventory or maybe something uh, wasn't in top condition or whatever. So but, that was on um, the phone? That was on the that phone, was, Mark? That was on the phone. Oh, but okay. we, we graduated to um, an online, a fully online ordering system uh, through uh, this platform that we use for a point of sale called Revel. And the interesting thing is that it required um, actually updating or keeping up to date the inventory of all the products that we're selling so that, oh, so that okay. we could in fact assure the customer that when they place the order that the product is actually available. And it's quite tricky, we found out. Um, takes quite a lot of energy and um, there are times when you, you know, the night before you think you've got something, uh, plenty of uh, product on hand, you come in the next morning and it's no longer in such good condition. So uh -huh. it's, it's it made a, you up your game, it forced you to up your game then. Indeed. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did, uh, Adams did a, a curbside pickup, but it, it was a pain in the neck because it's not easy to find a parking spot at Adams. <laughs> so we had people pull up and phone in, phone, mm -hmm. you know, we had the parking spaces labeled, space one, space two, space three, space four. And you, when you got there, you called on your telephone and said, you know, I'm in space one. And they would come out. And of course, the people had to do the shopping. And some people thought that was great because, you know, I, it saves you a lot of time not to have to go into shop. But it was a pain in the neck for, for us to tell you the truth. And we were kind of hoping it wouldn't last. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can share a similar experience. Uh, so we, uh, Poughkeepsie Farm Project, we actually had been doing a lot of our CSA signups in person with paper forms. And uh, we wanted to minimize uh, person to person contact during the CSA signup period uh, starting last year. And so we did switch over to doing most of our sales um, using a Shopify platform. Um, so that's been a new process for us is actually posting all of those shares, um, updating the share prices and doing a lot of those transactions um, not in person. Um, and we've also changed, and this is not specifically um, to your question, Jennifer, about using online, but, but a result of that, uh, of the way that we changed our share pickup was to transition from a more market style in-person pickup to a drive-through distribution. Um, and Mark, sort of like you were observing that some customers liked that better, while most of our members wish that they could go back to an in-person pickup for all of the choice and flexibility that it offers, we do have some people who are in love with this new drive-through model because it saves them so much time at pickup. Um, so we're hoping to not have to go back to that entirely. Um, but one of the things that we have learned that we may change going forward is to offer the opportunity for folks who are tight on time to pick up a pre-packed share if they don't want to come in and actually select their own vegetables. I think that I th always thought that part of the CSA was the camaraderie and the, you know, the idea of coming in and, and doing that. I mean, you know, I always thought that was part of the, part of the cachet of, of joining a CSA was, you know, the social aspect. So I don't understand why people would want to just drive through and pick up their their share. 
Yeah, I feel the same way. And a lot of our members do really miss the time to mingle and connect with other CSA members and with us. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that, that I felt like we faced during COVID was trying to foster that sense of, of community and connection without being able to do it in person every week. Um, so we really had to change our communication methods and styles. We started sending out an email every week, right before pickup, letting folks know what's in their share, what their choices are, giving them recipe tips. That's another thing that we would often talk about at CSA distribution um, or making announcements like, you know, you may notice some tiny pinholes in your arugula. This is from flea beetles. Here's oh what I know. Flea beetles. <laughs> or we're going to be cleaning garlic this week. Come join us if you know. So uh, we really had to change the way we communicated electronically to try to fill in some of the gaps that were left from being able to do more in-person connection, which is definitely one of the nice, nice parts of joining the CSA. So. So um, Lauren, tell me a little bit about your CSA association that you uh, you say you, you there's an association of all the CSAs. Um, what is that all about and what do they do? What do you do with them? Yeah, so the Valley CSA Coalition um, was actually, I don't know exactly when it was founded, but um, it is a voluntary coalition of CSA farms. And um, I'm not exactly sure how many farms are in the coalition, but it's, it's a good number. And they range from... Um, you know, north and south, this side of the river, the other side of the river. Um, the coalition itself is currently housed at Glenwood, even though it is a separate coalition, um, and receives funding for various initiatives and projects that are identified by CSA farms in the region as being high priority. So a few years ago, um, the coalition used some of their funding to hire someone to do research on, um, on consumer perception of CSA and of cost and price. Um, and they gave an interesting presentation about their findings that basically indicated that in a lot of places, the CSA market is not saturated and that there are actually a lot of opportunities for increasing CSA sales with the right kind of communication and marketing that addresses the some of the barriers around perceived expensiveness of CSAs. Um, more recently, the CSA Coalition has been expanding more into food access and has received a grant from the USDA to provide funding, um, a revolving loan fund that allows CSA farms to offer their CSA shares at a 50% discount to anyone who has uh, SNAP EBT benefits. Um, so that's a pilot program that we've been participating in for the last uh, season and a half. Um, yeah, so if anyone's interested, the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition uh, does some great stuff, hosts a few CSA fairs every year. I know I've seen Mark and some of his folks at those events in the past. Um, yeah. So is there, I remember, um, or the early days of CSA, you know, Dan Gunther, um, everybody just having kale and lettuce and all kinds of greens. Um, are you finding more people that are more trying to find, you know, trying to get other interesting kinds of things into the, into the bag that you pick up? Um, I'm thinking, Sweet corn is kind of like the holy grail of uh, of farm markets, farmers markets, and CSAs because you know fresh sweet corn. I notice Amanda says she has white corn now, but are are you seeing uh, an effort to try to find other interesting things to put into this into the CSA uh, share to try to attract more people? Is that a thing? You know, that's a great question. Um, we, because our CSA has expanded so much in the last few years, we have focused less on interesting things and more on things that produce a lot on the lands that we have. Oh, okay. So we have actually stopped <laughs> okay. growing 
something like broccoli, which is very popular, um, but for the acreage that we have to devote to it, we can't reliably get enough broccoli to satisfy our CSA oh, customer. Interesting. Um, and sweet corn. We, we did sweet corn one year that I was at PFP. Um, but generally for things like broccoli, we say go to Adams for things like sweet corn. <laughs> You say go visit someone else. Our so broccoli go- comes from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So it's a good question. Uh, I think we're at a place where that's not something that we're trying to do. But I can see how if we were in in a market with other uh, more more closely with other CSA farms, it may be another way of trying to sort of um, diversify and and make our product stand out in terms of what we offer. How about carrots? Is that something that you can do? Oh, we do so many carrots. Cause you get a lot of carrots for an acre. Mm-hmm. If you do it, if you do it right. And our, our former farm director, Leon was really, was really focused on his carrot game. So we now have a, a pretty intense system for tarping and rolling and remaying right after we direct seed. And there's a whole, there's a whole system. So we have been, we have been getting pretty good carrot yields the last few years. Okay, good. Yeah. And our tomatoes are great. Yeah. Oh yeah. I saw them. So. <laughs> Ma, could I say something about the um, additional products in the, the CSA bag? Sure. Sure. I mean, cause it's a really interesting question um, that goes a little bit to the heart of um, the CSA and some of the issues you brought up, like, um, you know, the, the shopping, the shopping for the customers or the CSA uh, drive through pickup, uh, which is the issue of, of convenience. And so, you know, I, I feel like one of the things we have to be most aware of when we're doing our farm markets and CSAs and so on, is that we're actually asking our customers to make quite a dedicated effort to come and uh, come to the property to cut to the farm and um, that in return we should offer um, as many products that they might need um, to them so for their right. convenience so um, extending this out a little bit uh, what we're doing at Fishkill Farms and perhaps it's because we have a farmers mar- a farm store on the property but but not entirely it's you know to do with all of the facilities on the farm we're able to purchase products meat dairy, cheese, um, breads, um, and in fact, even fish, um, wonderful, um, wonderful uh, trout from, from Hudson in order to offer add-ons, what we call add-ons to the, to the CSA membership. And so these are, are chosen specific, you know, by the individual type of product, um, specifically by the by the customer and it simply adds on to the price they pick it up on the day that goes into the share it does into the csa share yep yeah um yeah I, you know that's interesting because if amanda scusa had been on she she was telling me that you know she's selling she has a farm market in lagrange in billings and she started uh, having lemons she she put some lemons in there you know and she said she felt, I'm not going to speak for her, but I, well, she wouldn't care if I said it. She was wondering if that was a little bit weird to have lemons at a farm market. But, you know, people come in and they buy all the stuff and then they say, geez, now I got to go to Hannaford to buy a lemon. So, um, you know, is it a convenience for the customer and how far can you go? And I know there's some kind of a legal definition here of what you can sell at a farm market, Jennifer. Is it something to do with the, the amount? Uh, you're muted, but uh, I can't understand. Percentage. Oh, maybe it's a percentage, and I believe it's 50%. Yeah. Okay, so, but I know when we first started at Adams, when we first started selling stuff that we didn't grow, um, it was 1960, and a guy came down with uh, from Vermont with the Coombs maple products, and he pulled into this, we had a little farm stand then, and he said to my father, yeah, you know, um, you should grow, you should sell these little maple products, these little, they're a little a maple leaf, a little leaf and a little, it's like a pilgrim made out of maple candy. 
and uh, my father said, no, no way. We only, we only sell what we grow. Forget it. And my brother and I, we were 10 years old. We said, come on, dad, <laughs> sell the I love those. Get them, get them. So he did, you know, and, um, you know, now we sell a lot more than what we grow for sure. So, you know, and the other question is when someone shows up at your place, you want to sell them as much as possible. And that's where the cut flowers come in with the CSAs and with the farm markets and the farmer's markets. If, you, if everybody who comes in buys a bunch of cut flowers that you may be growing on site, that's the whole added revenue for you, you know. So those are things to think about when you got your market. Well, we we love the idea of supporting the local farm community. So that too, yeah, because you're getting your other meat and your other thing. Do you sell Hudson Valley Fresh? We uh, like to think of ourselves when the CSA is running the summer CSA as um, one of the one of the large orderers from Sam and and, and his happy crew. We get a pretty big chunk of milk from them. All right. <laughs> So we're all supporting each other. Um, one of the problems we have at Adams is that uh, it's very difficult. And I was kind of joking around about the, you know, if my cousin ever hears what I said about the broccoli, he'll slice my head off. But um, we have a lot of, a little bit of trouble buying locally because of the volume that we sell. Um, we had a fellow growing zucchini squash for us one year and he came in with a half bushel of zucchini squash. And it lasted about five minutes, you know. So, you know, it's tough for us to buy local, but we, we're buying a lot from Davenport Farms in Kingston, and we're we're trying to buy as we buy a lot of local meat, um, which I think meat is a huge, huge part of the local scene in in Dutchess County, and I'd like to see you know more of that explored in the, in in local farm markets. So. I'll just add, uh, you know, we don't, the Gypsy Farm Project doesn't have the amazing store uh, that Fishkill has, um, but we also want to try to offer more products to our members, even if we're not directly in charge of it. So we do have some add-on shares. Um, we do work with Glory Farms across the river to offer some fruit. Um, we... Uh, we allow people to add coffee shares There's to, from North River Roasters. They do local roasting in Poughkeepsie. Um, and we just started welcoming back Back Paddock Farm, which does grass-fed uh, grass beef. Um, I great, believe, great. yeah, so, and they're just showing up at CSA. We've just invited them to show up next to Fruit Share. So we're not, you know, it's, it's a very informal relationship, but it's a nice opportunity to support other farmers and still offer, as Mark was saying, a little bit more convenience, not quite the convenience um, that Fishkill offers, but the ability to get more than just vegetables, to also get fruit and coffee and meat. Uh, it would we would love to do more than that. We just don't quite have the space for it. So, yeah. Okay. I'm, so, uh, oh, sorry, Mark. Oh, no, um, go, 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 go. I was go, just going to say, Lauren, do you find that a lot of your members are taking advantage of these opportunities? Yes, the, the fruit share is pretty consistently popular um, and has been sold out for a little bit. So we have about 150 fruit share members to our 500-ish vegetable shares. Um, oh, I forgot, we also offer egg shares from Old Ford Farm. So those also sold out pretty early. Um, this was our first time having meat back at distribution since before COVID. Um, but it sounds like a lot of folks were interested in pre-ordering from her and picking up next week. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a nice thing to offer. And I think we probably could do more if we had the, the capacity for storage and transactions. So yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions here? For our panel, we have a great panel tonight. I tell you, I, I really, we have some of the most important people in Dutchess County agriculture represented right here. And I really appreciate you all spending your time with us. So, um, Jen Murphy, Hi. I see you. Don't you have a question? 
Um, I do. I All have right. started doing a little farm stand. I'm out of Poquag. Um, so I grew up in LaGrangeville. My parents have the Hitzman farm on 82. My golly, that's a big deal. <laughs> so um, I've started doing my own little thing here. So, so I was just wondering if anybody had any um, maybe advice for someone who's starting out. Okay. Uh, geez. Who can speak to that? Sam, I don't know. Do you know, do you have some advice about that? <laughs> don't do it, right? No. <laughs> I just, just remember you're going to be working hard for nothing for a couple of years. And you have to put yourself out there, test your market, offer a good product and don't start to offer a hundred things, offer a few products that you really have control over, that you know the volume and uh, be realistic on your price point and um, don't overload yourself with overhead. I have, a, I have a, a, something that I tell people, um, ask yourself, why would someone come to my establishment rather than somewhere else. Um, it could be as simple as I'm closer, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm closer to, to them. Yeah. But you have to have a, re a reason, be honest with yourself. Why would, why would, if I were a person who, you know, didn't know me, why would I go to your place? And you have to have an answer. Uh, maybe it's a product that you carry that you can't get anywhere else. Or maybe it's just as simple as I'm close by. Um, yeah, that's why well, there's so many pizza places, you know. So far, I've been getting some feedback from people and they are from the community um, touching on like the flower um, idea that you have there. Um, people have been coming for the flower arrangements and stuff like that. And they've been, I guess, word of mouth on Facebook and stuff like that. So um, I guess just keeping up on that yeah um i had a i i said of a person i told a florist one time um who couldn't get any customers get a flower arrangement for like 5.99 and put it right out there every single day mm -hmm. people will come by every day and buy it well i can't make money on that well just you know sell it at cost just so they come to your place every day for that arrangement and you'll get the traffic, you know, something like that. Why would they come to your place? That's what I want to know. And if you can answer that, you're, you're golden. So that's my advice. <laughs> Thank you. Jen, I have a question for you, which is why are you doing this? <laughs> Maybe because I'm crazy. I'm a, at least a third generation. So I grew up farming. So I'm a little crazy. Like when my friends are just sitting at home watching TV or reading a book or whatever, I'm out in my garden harvesting stuff. Like before this, I was harvesting in the garden. I did a batch of pickles and then it's like my timer is going off. I have a meeting to go to because I want to start getting involved in agriculture again. That's so good. I guess I didn't mean for that to be a snarky, sarcastic question. I genuinely, I'm, I want to know what is it that you like why, like, why are you doing this? Is it because, what, what do you want for yourself out of this venture? So I think, because I think, that, I think that's going. I think that I don't, I just have a calling. I believe a lot in, you know, local products and I've been advocating for, especially when COVID hit or whatever, like I'm big on, I want people to know where their food comes from. I want them to have like a fresh product and stuff like that. I think my, one of my things is that I have a lot of passion. So I've had a hard time with figuring out just like one calling. Cause I originally did a lot of like vegetables and stuff like that, but like my flowers bring joy to people. So I'm still, I feel like I have a lot of like irons in the furnace where it's like, I'm being called in different directions and I'm not exactly sure yet exactly which one to answer to, if that makes sense. Well, I'll tell you, you're, there's a lot of opportunity in Dutchess County for farming, yeah. a lot of opportunity. You could be an on the ground floor 
of a whole new thing, you know. I mean, it's just it's just starting. We've got a lot of opportunity here, so I think it's going to be great for you to do that. And and to come in on this call is a good for is a good thing to do because we've got a lot of uh, interest here. Are, are, where, are you open now? Is your place open now? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it at Hitzman Farms? No, my parents have their own separate thing. I'm over in Poquag, over off of 216, like over by Sugar Maple Farms. Okay. What's the name? What's the oh. name of your what's the name of your stand? Um, we're Sunflower Hill Farm. Oh, Farm. Okay. So have you I want to stop in sometime. Have you um connected with the cut flower people of the Hudson Valley? There's a ton I of them and go ahead. I have not. Okay. I think that that is a really important piece for you because what they do, okay. they all work together. Um, so if someone's doing a wedding, so maybe, you know, even though you're doing farming from a store, from your own, you know, farm store or stand, they do a lot of cut flowers and someone will say, listen, I don't have any such and such to you. And they work, they really network together and getting that networking okay. piece is really going to help you in the, in the end game. It really will. Even if it's not something you're necessarily interested in doing, it's that networking piece, because all of a sudden, you know what, you may have something that nobody else grows and they're going to be like all over that. And I think that will help you get established along with then doing, you know, the vegetables or whatever else you want to do. Making those connections is really critical to, to your success. It really is. And it's hard because when you're, when you're on the farm, I think Amanda's really good about getting off the farm and doing like farm bureau things. Mark is, you know, Lauren, I'm sure you are too. You do a lot of the social media stuff. So that's an important piece to not just stay on the farm, get that, get to know some people, get the networking piece. I think that's yeah, really very important. Yeah, now, see? Yes. He's doing it right now. Yep. <laughs> that's great. I think that, uh, this is Mark, um, one of the interesting components of this question is that, um, you know, much of the conversation is about uh, farmers as owners, right? Owning the business, owning the land. And I think that it's actually quite useful to split the question into um, the business question, the business feasibility on the one side and um, a career and a lifestyle on the other side. So, um, you know, thinking that enables one to think about oneself um, a little bit more specifically, and it goes to the really the heart of Lauren's question. Um, you know, Lauren and I uh, don't uh, own property or own the business we're we're employees and um so it's obviously forces that perspective uh quite a bit but i would say um without a shadow of doubt that there are so many opportunities uh even uh, and maybe even particularly as an employee in agriculture but that um when looking at a business opportunity it's a probably a good idea to separate the two the two ideas. Okay, Mark. Thank you. So uh, that's great, Jen. I, 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 I don't get out that far sometimes, but I want to stop out and see your place. Definitely. It sounds beautiful. Um, and uh, so do we have any other questions here? Because uh, I know, um, I don't know, Sue's making dinner. We're having fresh beans from the garden tonight. <laughs> so how about you, Sam? You're going to have dinner? You're going to get some trout? You're muted. Just shake your head. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I want to thank everybody who was here tonight, who was on the panel. And uh, I think we're going to uh, kind of sign off and, um, I really appreciate it. We had a we have a great group of people here, and we we learned a lot. So, um, you guys can keep talking. I'm leaving. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. everybody. Right. Thank, you. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Don't forget about next week's uh, land under pressure. Oh, um, land under pressure. Land under I'm pressure gonna... is next week. So that's if you're if you're okay. available, go up and sign up for it. Uh, share it on your social media. And thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks. Next okay. Wednesday at 7. Hope okay. to see you there. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody.